Is it on now? Yeah. Oh, now it is. I can hear it now. Good. Well, this is intended to, I won't try, get too far into it because it's the dean's um, idea and I want her to do the introduction, but just be thinking of things you'd like to talk about because this is not a formal presentation but more of a conversation to follow up and see what kinds of things you're interested in knowing about and, and then we'll go and I won't have all the answers, I can tell you that for sure, but I'll have a few. So, um, sh well, I think, uh, Carol, right? Yeah, Carol Howard. I'm so curious what you do on Sundays. I, I um, well, what do, the question is what do I do on Sunday since I don't have a church on Sunday. I do supply work, which is kind of like substitute teaching in other people's churches. And I also, um, I go to church myself at St. St. Mary's Church in the town where I live. And I go with my husband, and we actually get to sit in the pew together. And he's a priest also, but he's retired, and so he does supply work. And we, we're kind of in the position where we can basically afford to, to do ministry with people who can't really afford to pay a priest. So we did, one of the things that inspired me to go to seminary was we did 13 years of short-term ministry on the Arctic Circle in the Diocese of Alaska, working with the native people. When the, when the natives started in Alaska, and then the civil rights movement came in the South, and our church got very involved in the civil rights movement, as it should, uh, but a lot of the money diverted to the South. So a lot of the villages did not have money to continue to pay their priests. In, a, in the Diocese of Alaska. And so they, they left. The priests had left. I mean, they had families. They couldn't afford to do it for free. Well, the native people, mostly women, have kept those churches alive. And, and some of those churches are 100 years old. So they're, they look for clergy to come in and do Eucharist and whatever else needs to be done that's accumulated. So that's what we have done for Christmas and Easter uh, for 13 years, until about three years ago. And then now what's happening is they're beginning to train their own people using a couple of programs that we developed through Bexley Seabury. I wrote the grant for one of those programs. I'll tell you about it if we have time. Uh, but that's what I do. We, I do ministry everywhere. I'll go from here to Chicago this afternoon and then from Chicago to uh, Virginia. On Tuesday, I'll do four hours of training on the Doctrine of Discovery with a new... Uh, have you done Doctrine of Discovery in Oklahoma? You've done that training, I imagine. We've yeah. not done the training, no. but Brad Hoff was with us yeah. last year yeah. mm -hmm. and opened for us that conversation around yeah. the Doctrine of Discovery. So we have so much more learning to do, yeah. though. I have. Uh, I, I did uh, six hours of training for the Diocese of Montana mm. on a clergy conference. The bishop just pulled all the clergy together and we just plowed through it. Is Ken and Betsy yeah. still with us? So Canon Betsy is our Canon to the Ordinary uh -huh. who is with us for worship today. And what we will be letting her know is that you are available yeah. um, as your schedule permits to come sure. and do some clergy training with us sure. around the Doctrine of Discovery. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's, this part, is my it's part of my job, so there's no stipend for it. You just travel. Mm -hmm. so, so this is... Price um, is right. I told Mary that I was going to get us coffee. This is my pre-coffee coffee, coffee. Oh. Um, and Lauren is going to be bringing us coffee. Thank you. Um, there's, there's my love of God, then there's my love of coffee. I'm, I'm there. And then there's love of sleep, and then there's love of everything else. Yeah. And yeah. Thankfully, my husband knew this before we got married, Good. Where, where he would, you know, rank. Um, How many years have you been married? We have been married. Let's see, we got married in 2012. So we're coming, so we've been married for oh, almost 11 years. Almost 11 years. Since I was ordained in 20. So we got married in, in January, uh -huh. which for me just feels sort of like unfair because by the time we get to like 
you know, August, mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 we should be able to count this as a full year, right? Yeah. Like, we've gotten a long way here. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, uh, Mir, as we, as we get ready to start, I know that we've sort of unofficially started, but. Yeah, it was just to. I love it. Talk a little bit, yeah. I would love if you would open us with a prayer. Oh, sure. Can you start us of course. with a prayer? Yeah, yeah sure. You don't have to stand if you don't want to. I just stand for myself. The Lord be with you. And also with you. God, our creator, we give you thanks for this gathering today where we can eat together and share our stories and get to know one another and get to know all the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. This is the way of reconciliation, and you've shown us the path for that. We ask that you will guide us as we continue to move together to get better acquainted, natives and non-natives, do some projects together, and just help us to recognize what happened in the past, but also recognize the tremendous future we have ahead of us. Bless all of those who work here in the cathedral. Bless all of those who attend here. And let us remember that our brother Jesus is the reason that we're all together. And we ask you to just bless all of those who are ill and would like to be here but can't be here. Mm -hmm. And bring us back together in the future, Lord, if it is your will, because we'd like to work together some more. We pray this in your holy name. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our brother, the one who broke no promises. Amen. Amen. Alrighty. So before we get started, I just something that maybe I think we didn't communicate super well, which is there are, oh, look at you. Oh, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, thank you. In the reception area, there are cracks for kiddos, which does not mean that kiddos have to leave this space. Yeah. All kids are welcome in worship and anywhere. So um, be exactly as God created you to be, and that's for everyone. So as we go through about the next hour of our program, if you need to stand, you should stand. If you need to use the restroom, head right out this door. Restrooms are back here. Um, we're in church, but you know, we're not in church. Um, but also, just for what it's worth, you are also invited to be exactly who you are in worship as well. So, um, there will be a time for you all to be asking questions of Mary and, um, and um, just, it's our time together. And so, I do have those some questions that I have here. Um, and Mary, I just have to tell you, it has been so... It's been so exciting for me. Mm -hmm. um, just as a little bit of, 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 of preface, my, my family comes from, um, similar to yours, both a Danish and Native uh, background on my mother's oh. side. So my uh, grandfather is a, was a first-generation uh, first immigrant from Denmark, mm -hmm. and my grandmother, or I guess my great, no, hang on, let me get this straight. My great, so my great-grandfather, uh, first generation immigrant from Denmark, and then my grandmother um, was uh, was half half native from the Lakota tribe. So my my great grandfather, his name was Zella Eagle Eye, and he used to travel around um, in this sort of like cowboys and Indians kind of show, um, which. Obviously, we learned later in life was not the most respectful of his dignity, um, but uh, Zella Eagle Eye was a product of boarding schools in, at Carlisle, um, and and so my my own history, um, as we as we sort of bemoaned a little bit, has been derailed a smidge in that. Um, in the early 2000s, what I was going to be spending my summer doing was going to, to Michigan, where my mother's family is from, mm -hmm. and was going to be doing a deep dive into our indigenous heritage. And then um, this thing called COVID happened and yeah. wasn't able to do that. Um, and so um, I have, interestingly enough, I, I love that we just share a little bit of ancestry. And so... 
I consider us kin in all of our... We're all related, that's what we say. That's right. Yeah. So your Lakota people would say, we are kin. We are kin. Yeah. Um, and our Danish people, even if they wouldn't say that, um, genetically, I always like to say it's my Danish heritage that um, tries to keep me very well prepared for winter. <laughs> um, which I have to remind my genetics, we, we live in Oklahoma now, and it's very hot. Yes. Um, so my first question for you, Mary, is what drew you to the Episcopal Church? Okay. Well, I think I mentioned that my mother was Methodist and my father was Lutheran. They did not want to choose one denomination over the other. So they had us children attend a non-denominational evangelical community church in South Texas, hmm. Alamo, Texas. And so I grew up in that framework, if you will. And I had a lot of friends who were Baptists, so I learned how to speak Baptist with them. <laughs> and then in my senior year, my Sunday school teacher took it upon himself in the Alamo Community Church to tell me that my faith was not very strong. And that he knew that, because I asked him, why would you say that? How, how would you even know? He said, because you ask too many questions. Yeah. By now, you should know the answer to those questions. In other words, I should have indoctrinated you by now. And so I actually went home and told my parents I will not, not go to church anymore. And they said, well, it's up to you. I was 16 years old at the time. And they said, if you don't want to go to church, we don't believe in forcing you to go to church. So you do what you want to do. Well, so I didn't, I didn't go to church. And then later, I met someone who went to the Unitarian Church. And she invited me to come there. I never joined the church, but I did go there because they had such a freedom of inquiry. So for me, it was like good medicine. I could ask questions. But then I realized I, I couldn't leave Jesus behind. So I, I tried out the Methodist Church. I'll spare you some of the details. But what happened with the Methodist Church was they moved their clergy around there about every three years. And I was in a church that was really had a wonderful, vivacious, optimistic pastor who was then moved away and replaced with someone who obviously did not wish to be in South Texas. Mm -hmm. And so I was ending up going home feeling worse than when I went to church in the morning. So I said, I'm not gonna do that. And I mentioned it to a girlfriend, by then I was an adult, and I, I said, I just gotta find a church, but it can't be there. She said, well, why don't you try my husband's church? He's an Episcopal priest. And I said, really, you're married to a priest? You know, because she was very bright and with it and taught English. <laughs> and, uh, well, because, you know, some of the women that I had been associated with who were married to clergy, they literally got used clothes out of the missionary barrel. Mm -hmm. And she didn't do that. So she said, yeah, I'll go down to Bob's church and see if you like it. So I interviewed him before I went. And I said, I need to be able to ask questions. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of faith, but I have a lot of questions. So he said, well, Mary, I can't promise you that I'll have all the answers, but I can promise you that in most Episcopal churches, you will be free to ask questions, and you will definitely be free to ask questions in, in, at St. Matthew's was the name of the church. So he said, why don't you just come down and try it? So that's, I tried it and I felt right at home and my, my background with the church really is kind of a crazy quilt because that was a little tiny church meeting in a funeral home. The funeral home was, it had been sold to the church. And the first thing you saw when you came in the front door was a big picture of a, like a, a Michelangelo kind of rendition of Jesus with this very sly smile on his face. And it kind of made you wonder, what is he smiling about? You know? <laughs> and it was offensive to a lot of people, but we thought it was fun. And so I, that's how I found the Episcopal Church. I didn't really know anything about it, but I could ask questions, and that's what I wanted to be able mm. to do. So. 
how did that, um, you know, you talk about the introduction to the Episcopal Church, this, this gift of being able to ask questions. Mm -hmm. How then, how did God reveal to you your call to ordained ministry? Well, I think I sensed the call many decades ago because when I was in undergraduate school, I was a psychology major and I, we had to take a lot of vocational tests and mine always came out consistently, clinical psychology and clergy. Mm. But I said, clergy? I didn't even give it a thought because everybody knew there were no female clergy. So I never even took it seriously at all. And then um, about, well, I graduated seminary and was ordained in 2012, so back up four years, about uh, 2008, give or take, I just had this awareness one day, like, are you going to answer the call this lifetime? Mm -hmm. You're not getting any younger. So if you're going to do it, it's time for you to move forward. That was kind of not a voice in the sense of a, an articulate, real voice, but it was definitely an awareness. Yeah, I call mine a, a deep sense of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, I also, in, in, in my own call story, have a moment where I call it the Jesus two by four. Ah, uh, yes. Right to the head. Like, yeah. I was gentle, and now I'm not being gentle yeah. anymore. Well, I, it caused me to take it seriously, mm -hmm. and I was teaching in the Southern Baptist University at the time, and I was, uh, I went to the president, who was a friend of mine, very, he was a really kind of a moderate sort of SB, if you can imagine that, and I told him, I, I'm gonna go through the discernment process. Do you want me to resign? Mm. And he said, why would you resign? And I said, well, you guys don't ordain women very often, and I, I'm going to be a priest if this goes all the way through. And he said, no, no, you don't have to resign. Just, you just can't teach in theology. And I said, well, you can't teach in our theology either. So <laughs> <laughs> we were kind of like, okay, well, that's all right. We can live with that. So I continued to teach. I was the dean of the School of Education the whole time I was in seminary. The seminary was Friday night and all day Saturday every other week for four years. So that's how I went to seminary. I didn't give up my job. Was it like an Iona program? No, it was face-to-face -face at Claremont School of Theology. Oh, lovely, yeah. okay, yeah. wonderful. But the first two years were run through the Episcopal, called Boy House. Okay. It was uh, Anglican studies that had been started two years before then, and, or more than two years, but it was two years, and then we transferred into the MDiv program at uh, Claremont and got, the end of was from Claremont. Wonderful. Yeah, so, wonderful, wonderful. So it was kind. Of, it was the Jesus two by four. I like that metaphor. Bam. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, you have such a unique ministry mm -hmm. as a bivocational priest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I want. I'm wondering if you can share with us, ex maybe explain to us. The benefits of that kind of ministry, right? Um, the here at the cathedral, we have um, bivocational ministers in the form of our deacons. Mm -hmm. We have one priest who's a bivocational priest, sort of, and that would be Father Tim Sean, who is um, uh, the uh, the chaplain at an Episcopal school, mm -hmm. um, and then with us on Sundays. But we don't get to encounter a lot of bivocational priests here. And what are some of the benefits of that ministry? How is it? How has that kind of ministry allowed you or benefited you in living out the call that God has for your life? Well, I think it benefited me because I did not have to give up my ties with the university. Mm. And I love learning, and I am a scholar. So that's why I thought it was kind of weird that I would end up at St. Michael's because I have a, I mean, I have a bachelor's degree from Cal Berkeley and I have a doctoral degree from Columbia University. And I write, you know, I'm a thinker. Uh, but. So that was a benefit to me to stay with the university, that I could continue to stay, stay active academically. 
and then um, the, are there dis the disadvantages are that if you're not really well disciplined time-wise, it can eat up all of your time. Mm. Um, it was very difficult for me to disengage to take this trip because it's a, about a 10-day trip. This is just the first stop. And there were things at the church that were commanding my time that were related to the building opening, and they had to be done. You know, there's no place to delegate some of it. I do have a really good administrative assistant, and she's, she'll cover while I'm gone, and then I'm getting a new deacon in uh, September from the diocese, uh, who will also be non-stipendiary, but he's, a, he'll be by, he, he's uh, retired. He, so the disadvantages are that if you're not careful, you really won't do a good job in either of your placements. But if you're pretty well disciplined, and, and my discipline comes from having to work my way through school. I had money from the Blackfeet Nation, but it was not enough for me to get everything paid. You know, I still had room and board, and so in undergrad school I was a secretary for 20 hours a week, and then I was a school teacher on my master's degree. Then on my doctoral degree I was in the process of starting a school for gifted children in Massachusetts. And so I couldn't really leave that, but the school where I was working was given a lot of money for advanced education. And so it paid for my tuition at Teachers College at Columbia. And so I went by Amtrak back and forth from Springfield, Mass to New York City for six years. Well, the last year was my dissertation and that was at Children's Hospital in Boston. So I drove, after I worked at the school, I got in the car and drove to Boston and worked there till about 10 o'clock at night and then drove back. So I'm incredibly disciplined. And my husband and I, we both grew up without money. We were both, he was a National Merit Scholar. That's what paid his way through undergrad school. But our families didn't, they, they were not wealthy at, at all. So we just learned that if we were gonna to go to school, that's how we had to do it. We had to get scholarships, and we had to get loans, and we had to work. So I can balance a lot of balls that allow me to be bivocational, because I'm always, it's always, that's always what I've done. Mm -hmm. My children are grown, and we have, uh, Will and I have been married 47 years. Mm -hmm. We've been married a long time. And we have, we, we both like a lot of the same things and because he was a priest full time, he understands my deal and I understand his deal and so it works for me. The church doesn't own me because I know if, if anything happens to St. Michael's and I wanna go back into the professor and I could go in a heartbeat, I could go full time right now into seminary teaching. But I, I, I don't want to. I want to stay. I want to do what I'm doing. So, so for me, it's actually an advantage, I think, because mm. I'm pretty hyperactive. I, I like people, and I like learning, and I like travel. And I don't think I would be really, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure I would be very good at all in a small um, church that is, you know, the bills are paid and the, and everything is working and people are happy because I do better in an environment where there's some breakage and some unresolved conflict or I'm a builder, I'm entrepreneurial and I'm a builder. So my work with the presiding bishop in designing new kinds of theological education, it works really well. It works for me. Hopefully it works for the indigenous people in the program too. So that, that's a great transition, and I want, <clears throat> I would love for you to tell us more about that. Before you do that, mm -hmm. can you um, explain to us what you're wearing and its significance? Okay. Well, this is called a Northern Plains breastplate, and it was essentially a gift of two elders at a, at a um, craft fair at a powwow at Montana State University. And these are, the, these are called bones, but they're plastic, they're not from deer or anything. These are Aus Austrian crystal. Mm -hmm. And the Northern Plains is long in the front as opposed to Southern Plains 
breastplate is shorter in the front and also in the back, so you have a front and back, but the Northern Plains is like this. So Blackfeet, Northern Plains, so this is my style. This is called a ribbon dress, and this was actually made for me by one of the women in the talking circle in Los Angeles. Her name is Martha Duran, and she did not approve my wearing this today. She wanted me to wear a different thing that she had made for me, but I wanted to wear this, so I'm wearing it. So that's, all, this is all together called regalia. And I have a belt. This is not the real belt. My real belt that was given to me is on my desk. I walked away and forgot it. So this is um, more of a costume kind of belt. The real belt is about this wide and it's brown leather and it has silver medallions on it that go around. Sometimes those are engraved, mine are just plain. But that's what I really should be wearing with it to, to to be proper with the regalia. Mm -hmm. And so the colors on there, you know, we prayed yeah. in our prayer of the four directions, mm -hmm. and each direction had a color mm -hmm. that, that correlated with it. Are, are the colors of the ribbons similar to that? Well, the kind of the traditional earth colors are black, white, red, and yellow. But some people add blue for water or sky. So these are the colors that would be appropriate for the elements of the earth that, mm. that we would use. So that's why I think Martha chose them. And then I like the red. The red is, can be the earth, you know, so it can stand for the earth as well. Oh, hang on one second. Um, Mother Sarah, will you take the microphone? We do have a microphone so everyone can hear. <laughs> While you're, uh, now you're seated, but I was going to say while you're standing, have you been in the presence of the Ochre Hater Chapel? Just barely this morning. I want to go in and uh, be there I'd before like, we leave. Uh, if you want to, for you to comment on what was chosen for the window, the circular window. Okay. I have looked at it often and just wonder what it speaks to you. Mm, okay. Mm. I would, my shoes are not, these are, they really should be beaded moccasins, but I, those are extremely expensive unless you can make them yourself. I do have some beaded moccasins from Alaska, but the flowers on them are very Alaskan, so I wanted to, I didn't wear them because I, I, I wanted to be consistent with the Plains style. Um, Thank you so helped. much. Mm -hmm. So will you transition then into just a very different topic and, and talk to us more about the work that you do on the presiding bishop staff. Okay, so the, we're not supposed to call it the National Church, we're supposed to call it the Episcopal Church Center. It's really the Episcopal Church worldwide because we're in 19 nations and a lot of us don't realize that, but we, when you work for one of the departments with the Episcopal Church, as a whole, international, you, you work on projects in other countries as well. So I am a member of the Department of Ethnic Ministries and my colleague is Brad Hoff. His title is the Indigenous Missioner. But at the general convention, not the most recent one, but the one before that, they funded a position called the Coordinator of Indigenous Theological Education. So I'm referred to as the educator. He's the missioner, I'm the educator. And I, my job is to really reform the way seminaries educate indigenous people. Because presently, the way that we go to seminary is by leaving our indigenous stuff on the side as we go in the door. Like, we don't really, there aren't courses that would, unless you're in school in Vancouver, Vancouver School of Theology, and then there's a Canadian group called NATES that I am actually working with right now at a preliminary level. When they plan a course in Old Testament, for example, they will make every effort to integrate storytelling and things that we would consider important as Native people. Like when you talk about the Bible as being a collection of stories of the people of Israel, 
Well, a natural thing you can do is say, our people, meaning Native people, also have this rich collection of stories that are culturally from their history. And those stories mean things, and we use those stories to teach people uh, our traditions. And that you don't find that in seminary. Now, there used to be a place called Cook Theological School in Arizona. It closed, but there's actually some talk about that might maybe reopening. So I wrote a grant, and my colleague at the seminary in Chicago, Bexley Seabury, wrote a grant, and we were each one funded for $200,000 from Trinity uh, Church Wall Street Foundation. And we use that money for scholarships for indigenous Episcopalians, mostly, although there's a couple that are not Episcopalians, <clears throat> who want to be leaders in the church. They may not know whether they want to be ordained or not, and that's okay. They don't have to be ordained. But if they are lead, working in the church and they want to do more, but they don't really know, they're not going to go to seminary out of town because they can't leave home. They don't have money to go to seminary. And in some cases, they, don't have, they haven't been to college. So they're running churches, but if they go into a Master of Divinity, they're going into a graduate program with no undergraduate preparation, which can be really challenging. Not impossible, but really hard. And then if they're in a traditional program, they're going to hear nothing that relates the people of Israel to the people of Oklahoma, for example, or Montana. So my job is to design programs that allow us to put those things together. Yes? Oh, hang on one, one second, Theta. Oh, I forgot mm -hmm. about the mic. When I was younger, my grandfather, Frank, he used to tell me stories about his dad, David, when um, they would have peyote meetings. Mm -hmm. He would go, but he wouldn't go in, and he would tell his wife, I'm going to sit out here, and as they're singing and praying, I'm going to sit out here, and I'm going to pray too. Yeah. And then when he would have church at the old whirlwind mission, he would always refer to, this is that book mm -hmm. that that Jesus brought to, to these people right. to teach us about the other world. Yeah. And he would turn around and take the Bible yeah. and relate it to our culture. Exactly. To our history. Mm -hmm. Like our ceremonies, our Sundance. Mm -hmm. He said they did that too. Sure. We do that. He said we sit in sackcloth and ashes and pray. He said the the people from this holy land did that. So you know, um, I've always looked at it if you could a lot of people, a lot of Native people don't, you know, they say that's that white man's good book. Right, that's right. And you've heard that before, yes. I'm sure. But if they really sat down and looked in it, and there's a lot of that in the Old Testament that relates to a lot of the nations. That's correct. And like the Cheyenne people, we have a prophet by the name of Sweet Medicine. And deep in my heart, my belief, nobody ever told me this or anything, but I felt like that he brought that bundle and our sacred things mm -hmm. to Bear Butte. And to me, I, in my mind, I have him pictured as the son of God. But he came to the different nations to bring them their religion, but it coincides with what yeah. the Bible says. Yes. And that's always been my belief. And I don't know if others would think the same or if I'm wrong, you know. But I always felt like that sweet medicine was Jesus and he came to our people. Well, I'll tell you something that's related to that. When we were in Alaska one winter, we were in the home of an elder. And my husband asked the elder, a woman, what was it like when the missionaries came through? Like, was there fighting, you know, because you read stories that, about really bad things happening. She said, no, not really. You know, they came through and they taught us. But then she went on to say, but we already had Jesus. And so it wasn't a big, you know, I'm paraphrasing, it wasn't a big deal for her. She didn't say those words, but she said, we already had Jesus, so we understood 
And what he was teaching, what the missionaries were teaching, is what we already knew. So my husband asked her, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And she said, well, we've been on our land for 10,000 years. And the reason I think Jesus was already here, she said, is because if you look at our values, our tribal values, and the Athabascan people often post in the living room of their home the values, the Athabascan values that a good Athabascan lives by. She said, if you look at those values, you can tell that they're the values Jesus taught. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was very humbling because she said, we've been on our land 10,000 years. When did Jesus come? It was about 2,000 years ago. If you talk to the New Zealanders and the Australians, they have been on their land 65,000 years. We have archeological evidence to show that. So what they're saying is our tribal values are consistent with in what you were saying, that what the Bible would teach. We honor our elders. We take care of the sick. We take care of the poor. And you know, we could just go down, if you look at the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, everything Jesus is saying that we should be doing, the native people are saying we already do it. Now obviously after colonialization, there are plenty of examples of native people where those values are not being practiced, unfortunately. But there are a lot more where they are being practiced. So they're really consistent with Christianity. They're, they're, and that's why my work is to point that out and to help people realize if, you're, if your relative is telling stories of showing how the Bible fits together with the traditions of your tribe, that's what we want. You know, that, that's healthy. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you saying that because I believe that to be the case. I don't think you have to give one up for the other. I think you can have both and. Mm -hmm. so we have another question here. It was so nice meeting you. I was in awe of you when you were talking this morning. Oh, and it's, thank you. it's a pleasure to, to have thank met you. you and listen to you about you know your life and what you what you preach. And it, it was a well. I am very. I would like to hear more of what you have to say. I hope this won't be my last trip to Oklahoma yes. because I think we could get together. Do you know what Winter Talk is? Have yes. you ever been to Winter Talk? That's a place where these kinds of conversations can happen too. Mm -hmm. But more than that, the cathedral can sponsor these kinds of questions. You know, we, we used to, um, Pat and I and mm -hmm. some of the others used to go to Winter Talk. Yes. They were, we were funded to go to Winter Talk. Pat can go still. I can't. Well, then maybe I can't can fly anymore. I oh, can't. okay. It's yeah. not a financial thing. Yeah. No, I can't. I can't fly. Like if it was in Alaska or somewhere, uh -huh. I can't go because I hear you. of um, a, an illness. Mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. but well, um, I think that do, are you comfortable using a computer at all to be on a call where you can interact with people? Um, my son could turn it on. For, yeah, my, I yeah. only turn it on. I can know how to turn it on. And that's it. Sure. Well, that's okay. <laughs> and, and play games. That's okay. <laughs> That's the way we're communicating with a lot of people in uh -huh. remote areas, like Alaska, for example. And yeah, I've got people in Alaska on. Oh, good. On my yeah. phone, you know. yeah. I, Judy, I've got her on my phone. Okay, Judy Gal. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. What you find out is that Indian Country Episcopalians is the same small community. You know, the Episcopal Church is not that big. It's a little over two uh -huh. million people. And so you'll find if you know somebody in Texas and they'll have a cousin in Minnesota and before you know you've got relatives in Minnesota and <laughs> California and Europe and um, so I think that the challenge is for us to figure out more ways to communicate mm -hmm. as natives and natives and non-natives. So I think that's the strength of the church that is possible. But the the degree program that I just finished writing, I have six people signed up and I have four more openings. And that is for people that will take two years of courses that don't require college at all. They're 
offered at the seminary, but anybody can sign up for them. And then the next two years, you go to Sitting Bull College. We uh, negotiated a partnership with Sitting Bull College in South Dakota, and you take six more theology courses there, but the other courses you take will get an AA degree, an Associate of Arts degree. So for no cost, because we have the scholarship money, it's called the two plus two program. Mm. Two plus two. And we're registering people, signing people up now for that. And you don't have to want to be get, being a priest or a deacon. You can be, I just want to be a better lay volunteer in the church. I really like you know, working in the Sunday school or helping with the altar or whatever you're still considered a leader in the church. So we're hoping that that will um, give people a way of learning more about the Bible, learning more about theology, learning more about the Episcopal Church without having to go and take out a loan to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Are there any other questions in the congregation? I have one last question for Mary, but I want to open up to the congregation and make sure we have time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, Robin. Oh. I, I noticed that um, your little uh, bio here says you have written two books. I'm having trouble You have here. written two books in the bio. It says you have written two oh, books. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Where can I get a copy of your books? I can, I can uh, give you copies of those articles that I mentioned there. Okay. They're not books. They're published in journals. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Sure, sure. If any of you want to be in touch with me, the easiest, I can either give you my phone number and you can text, or the email is just mcrist, as in Tom, mchrist, at episcopalchurch.org. That's my work email. Will you repeat that? Yes. M Chris. M. M. At episcopalchurch.org. It's like Christ, but no H. <laughs> so if you put me in Christ, it won't it won't go there. And then my phone number, I can give you that. It's public. Uh, every homeless person in Riverside has it, so you might as well have it too. <laughs> it's nine four nine three three seven zero seven two two. And texting is better than phoning because lots of times I'll be in a meeting and I can monitor a text, but I won't be able to answer the phone if I'm in a Zoom meeting. So if there's something you want to get involved in or ask more questions, I'd be happy to talk with you. So. And Brad Hoff, my colleague, he's a great person too. I mean, he's, he does a lot of work in mission work. He has, Brad Hoff has a PhD in clinical psychology. You know, he's, a, he's well educated, but he's like I am. He grew up with dirt poor, you know, so we have a lot of empathy for people who are trying to learn, but just don't necessarily have the money. We both went on scholarships. He did and I did, I mean. I think there's a request for you to repeat your phone number one okay, more time. Okay, sure. Oh, you got it? Okay, never mind then. Okay. So my last question for you, um, especially since I know that um, you have to fly out of here today. Yeah, I, I probably need to leave here by 2.30. We've got time. So what words of wisdom or encouragement or perhaps even admonition um, would you give to us as a cathedral? Uh, we are seeking to live more fully with indigenous people, both within our congregation, of which there are many, mm -hmm. and then outside of these walls, of which there are even more. <coughs> what do we need to be doing? What do, you know, where are we messing it up, and where can we be doing better? I don't think it's messing it up, but I, I'll give you a little challenge. When I was walking over with, uh, let's see... <laughs> Well, there was a group of us with, with Robin and also with Buzz and maybe two others. I heard somebody say to the drummers, the Caddo drummers, thank you so much for coming. See you next year. Well, that's great. You know, they should come back next year. But here's my challenge. Don't wait till next year. 
you know, get together with some of the indigenous people in the community and plan something before then. Every drum song that they play today has a story behind it. And you might well engage them in coming to talk to you about why do they play what they play? Can anybody play a native drum? Who made those drums? I mean, there's a whole body of knowledge around uh, drumming. The women that I work with in Los Angeles, it's a talking circle ministry, and we get invited every single year to the same church at the same time, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And last year, we said to them, invite us another time of the year. I mean, we don't mind coming then, but it's so cliche, you know, what are you, the instant Indians? Oh, it's Thanksgiving, we better get some Indians here. You know, and so, um, Actually, so the people were very nice, and they said to one of the women in the circle, we don't know how to get to know you. And she said, invite us for potluck and let us share our stories. And you share your stories too. So we could be sitting around circular tables in the parish hall, everybody brings food to share, and you just sit around and literally get acquainted. That begins to build relationships. It's like what I was telling you with the homeless people coming for dinner in the church. I didn't know any of them. I didn't really know. I assumed they'd all want me to build housing for them. Well, I didn't have any money to do that, first of all. And second of all, it turned out that wasn't their number one priority. Their number one priority was having a safe place to make friends, to have a family, to have a relationship. I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't had them come over. So you could do some potlucks, you know, let, let people come and tell their stories. What is Oklahoma like through the eyes of a Native American? Mm -hmm. what, what is Oklahoma City like? And, you know, I think then you get people sharing their stories and, and the, out of that will come projects that you might want to do together. Do you agree? Am I on the right track there? Mm. I mean, that, that's what we've done in, in the places where I work. And we do get invited a lot. The women get invited to come and sing and drum. But the thing is, this year we're not going on Thanksgiving. The same woman called me. And she said, well, it's that time again. And I said, at what time would that be? She said, well, you know, we want you to come to Trinity to before Thanksgiving. And I said, I can't do it this year. And she said, well, why not? And I said, because I have other invitations. But I said, we will, we will come and sing, but it doesn't just have to be the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And then she said, well, you know what I mean. And I said, I don't know what you mean, but I know what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is, get on with life and invite us another time. So they're gonna invite us for Rogation Sunday, hmm. which I thought was kind of cool because it involves planting and greens and creation care and the earth. I mean, I thought that was totally appropriate. But I finally just had to say, we're not coming the Thanksgiving. We're not doing that. So we don't wanna just be a cliche. So I would encourage you to, maybe have a meeting together and, and you have all, I mean, you have this whole center, the Ochre Hater Center is known all over the country. I mean, ask them what their needs are. What, is there anything that the, to, what about Vacation Bible School is kind of going out the window, that's what I read. You know, va Vacation Bible School is, there's not, it's same old, same old, and we're not doing it. Well, what could you do? I mean, I have a good friend in L.A. who created a program where he, he had to raise $35,000 every year. But he gathered up a bunch of kids from the street in L.A. and hauled them up to Pine Ridge. And, he, and his friend, Michael Cunningham, grew up on that reservation, and he's a priest. And now Michael Cunningham's sister is almost a priest. So they bring the street kids from L.A., and they work with the kids on the rest, but what they do is a project. Like one summer they built a dance arbor, and the next summer they built a skateboard park. 
So you see, you've got people working together and the project, everybody can work on the project together and they make friends while they're working on the project. Mm -hmm. I'm from, <clears throat> from a small community in rural Oklahoma. I found that when we have an event, and this happened last December when we had our native nativity right before Christmas, but you can invite and say, come and join us. Yeah. Uh, but I found that to be really successful is to use their talents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you come and sing a hymn in Creek. Sure. Or you come and play your flute mm -hmm. or to share their talents, you know, they're there and then they bring people with them. Yeah. So in most of the area that I'm from, the um, native, the indigenous people are dyed in the wool uh, from the churches where they were raised and their mother, right. you know, they're, they're just dyed in the wool and it's hard to get them to, to come somewhere different. Yeah. But if you put it that way and say, come and share your talents with us, sure. they're gonna show up. Yeah. And feed them. Yeah. <laughs> and feed them. Well, that's feed right. Them. I know everything we do is about potluck. <laughs> I would encourage you, though, especially here, 39 tribes in Oklahoma. That's amazing. I don't even think I can name 39 tribes. I know when we went to the museum, the Buzz and I spent all day yesterday in two museums, and I, I found several new tribal names that I had never heard of before. And they're right here in Oklahoma. So you've got a very, very rich uh, field of possibilities. Yeah. I really enjoyed you speaking today. Thank you. And um, it was such a blessing to be here. So I just want to thank you for blessing oh. myself and all of us. Yeah, sure. And <clears throat> it's a blessing for me to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I also was curious if you could speak a little bit more about your dreams. Like I was really curious. Mm -hmm. I have also been keeping like a dream journal for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really connected to uh, dreams. Mm -hmm. And was really interested when you were saying that, you know, you get your guidance through dreams and like the Holy Spirit, you know, is in dreams. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more. Well, I don't have, I, I don't tend to remember dreams, but when I do remember a dream, it's usually a really important dream. It's usually like a message dream. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. I was uh, accepted and prepared to go to New York to start my doctoral degree 10 years before I, before I actually started it. And the reason I was delayed was because the little Episcopal church that I was attending decided they would start a school. And they asked me to be the first head of the school and help design it and hire the faculty and so on and so forth. Which I, I said, I can't do that. I've just accepted. I'm going to New York. And the woman said, well, could you just pray about it for a week? I said, well, I'll pray about it, but the answer is going to be no, but I'll pray about it. So I prayed. I did pray about it. It was in my morning prayer every day that week. And I asked God, do I stay or do I go? Is it yes or is it no? And you know what the answer was in my dream? Wait. I was like, no, I don't want wait. Wait? <laughs> I want yes or no, stay or go. Nope, the answer two nights in a row was wait. Mm -hmm. So I decided that that probably meant don't go right now. So I made a decision, I turned down that fellowship, turned it all down, took a $5,000 pay cut, left the university where I was teaching at the time in special ed, and went and started Saint, helped start St. Matthew's School, which is still running today. Well, what came out of that is beyond what I could tell you. First of all, we built and paid for the first school in one year. Second of all, we built four more rooms the next year and paid for them. 
Third of all, this is where the Holy Spirit gets in my private business. <laughs> At the time, I was divorced and had two children. And three years after he came, the priest and I ended up getting married. And that's the one I've been married to for 47 years. So I think that God had a little plan there that I didn't know about. And I did pay attention to my dream. And I think if I had said, oh, I don't know, I asked for yes or no, you gave me wait, I'm going. I, it would have been completely different. My whole life would have been different. Mm -hmm. So I, I could, you know, there are many, there, like I t I'll tell my husband, I had a dream last night. And he goes, oh, no, are we going to have to move? <laughs> 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 because I had a dream that when our kid who was in the Marine Corps and his wife had our first grandchild in California and we were living in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, I said to my husband, we can't be 3,000 miles from grandchild number one, I'm sorry. So what about if I were to get a job on the West Coast, would you be willing to move, you know, to San Diego or somewhere south of LA where we could be part of their life? And he said, oh yeah, you get a job? He told me later, he said, I didn't think you had a chance in hell of getting a job in Southern California. <laughs> but I had a dream that we were going to California. Mm. So, I had a job 30 days later, and I didn't even go, I didn't even have time to start looking for it. I fell into the job at a Southern Baptist University because I happened to go to a Christian education conference, and there they were looking for somebody to help build the education program. And I got that job, and I thought I would get fired in the first year because I was a progressive Episcopalian. And I was honest. I told them, you know. No, I became instead, the, down the road, the dean, the dean of the School of Education helped build the School of Education. So we went from having 30 students to 900 students in the School of Education. And the university grew from 880 students to present day enrollment just under 12,000. So I learned a lot about leadership and that's all dream based. So I just wait for them. I don't try to structure them. I don't like say, God, I'm, please give me a dream and tell me what to do or anything like that. I just, they just come when they're meant to come. I think that's a very indigenous thing because I, I know a lot of native people who have active dream life and they use their dreams to make decisions and I do too. But so, I, I don't know, it just, it's just there. So, so here's my, my follow up and this will be our, our last <laughs> question before we um, release you back into the hands of our beloved Buzz who's Buzz. gonna make sure that you get food and, and get to the airport on time. Talk to me about being brave Talk to me about trusting in God. You talk about dreams. You talk about these, what I would call um, Mary-esque yeses. Mm -hmm. You have the dream. You have the nudge. You have the Jesus two by four. Mm -hmm. How do you follow it? What does that look like for you? What does that feel like for you? Well, I would just say I just do it. I mean, I don't... How do I follow it? I just, I just know what I'm supposed to do, and I feel it, and I make plans to, to do it, and I don't live with a lot of fear. Mm. I think that's part of my faith has help me to move beyond fear because I really am a believer that there's another life after this one. And it might, I guess how do I help people who live in fear? I try to listen to them. Um, I don't know the answer to that really just, it's intuitive. You know, when I take psychological tests, and they, measure, they try to measure intuition. I am off the chart on intuition. Mm. I don't think it's because I have any paranormal kind of thing. I think it's faith. Mm. You know, for me, it's just like, if you really do believe in God and you really do believe Jesus, 
and you really pay attention to the lessons that he has taught, then to me it's sort of obvious how we're supposed to live our lives. And I don't always, I mean, on my answer when my prayer life will be, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to go, but I don't know what I'm doing. How, you know, you got to, what's the revelation? I mean, how do you build an $8 million building when you don't have enough money to put a mobile home on your church property? You know, how do you do that? Well, someone asked about how do we pay for it. It was paid for with state and federal money for homelessness. Mm. Those programs vary across the country, but there are many of them that are uh, national level, and you tap into those and write a proposal, work with the city. It took four years to get that building approved, just so you know, it was not easy. The neighbors fought it tooth and nail. They posted ugly signs in their yards, but recently a guy came to me named Joe, and he said, I was your Saul when you were trying to get this approved, but I want to be your Paul mm -hmm. now, and I want to help you do a community garden. Do you have any interest? And we said, yeah, we do. So those are the kinds of things that I think when you can tap into the spirit, some people do it through meditation. Some do it, somebody was telling me this morning, through yoga. Some people do it through, I believe, prayer, centering prayer. Some people journal and they get revelation through that. I don't even have time to do any of those. I do it in my cathedral of the car. Mm. I call it my cathedral of the car because I drive 50 miles each way from home to where the church is. And, and I drive fast. I have a fast little sports car. It's a Nissan 370Z and it will get up and move. And so when I've got my music going and I'm on, that's kind of when I'm doing my prayer. It's kind of a meditative state. I bought the car used, lest you think it was, you know, a big million dollar Porsche or something. It's not, the, but I have fun with it. And I get revelation when I'm kind of in that zone of thinking about what's coming. And mm -hmm. I have an hour each way every day that I'm uninterrupted. So that's a good time for so really, really what I'm hearing is that um, it requires some intentionality mm -hmm. in your relationship with God. Yes. Um, and when I think about Mary, um, who gets asked to do this big, scary thing uh, to bear Christ into the world, um, the only reason she knew that it was God who was coming to talk to her, you know, besides the fact that it was like an angel, whatever mm -hmm. that looked like, mm -hmm. um, but she could trust that it was God because she had been so intentional in her relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And I'm really hearing that same echo, that to do the big scary, to do the brave, um, to do that unknown thing, it is mm -hmm. to be intentional in your relationship with God, not just when you're looking for an answer, but right. when you're just, it's just a Tuesday. Right, that's right, yeah, yeah. I, I ended up going back to church because one day I was sitting in a little house, a little rented house with my first husband in Springfield, Oregon, and we had two children, a two-year-old daughter and a newborn son. And he was at work and I was at home and I was sitting there holding that little baby boy. And I had a vision that was like, this must be what it was like for Mary mm -hmm. when she held Jesus. Where did that come from? I was not even going to church. I hadn't been to church for three or four years. And when I just, I just knew what I had to do. And so when my husband came home from work that day, I said, we have to go to church again. I, I have to go to church. I have to go to church again. And I told him what had happened, and he was like, okay, well, I'm, I'll go with you. I don't know that it's going to really mean anything to me, but I'll go with you. And I went back to the Methodist Church because they had a, a child care program where you paid a dollar, and all the older ladies in the church did the babysitting, and the ones who weren't babysitting, they taught us things. And there were things I didn't know how to do, like how to 
make jam or can vegetables or so somebody's stretch and so I mean they taught us how to do things that would that you didn't have to have a lot of money to do and I made that decision just like that just so there, there was that vision of this is what it was like for Mary holding Jesus mm -hmm. and you have not Mary even said Mary Chris you have not even said thank you to God for these two beautiful children and, and so I have a, I think if I could offer anything, whatever you could do that helps you to get in touch with that, it's just a piece beyond the rational. It's, it's, that's why I call it, it is truly the spiritual. It is the Holy Spirit, I believe. So whatever you can do that helps you to open your awareness to that part of life that is there all the time. I find it to be there all the time. I used to get it when I was doing CPE, you know, uh, clinical pastoral education, working in the hospital, going with a patient, you don't know anything about them, and you're really, you're trained to just become a very, very good listener and not tell them what to do, but help, help figure out, help them figure out but you know, things would just come, they would just come and I thought I was gonna be a chaplain because I really enjoyed the work and I was good at it, but here came St. Michael's instead. So I think we all have that capacity to, not to get rid of the rational, but to go beyond the rational. It's into that piece of reality that is more intuitive or, I'm trying to think of what the word would be. For me, it's intuitive. It's just being open to the presence of the spirit, and with that comes direction. I don't know if that helps or not, but that's kind of where it is. It's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. A big thank you to Mary for being with us today. Thank you. I think you can learn a lot of those things from your native friends. I'll say that, because I gave an interview to a woman from Episcopal News Service about two weeks ago, and she was asking me about St. Michael's Project and how did I learn leadership and how did I do leadership. And I, I said to her, I don't know, I just try to be nice to people and give them a place to do what they believe they're called to do. And I said, and then I just came out, I just said, I do native. My leadership style, I do native. And she was like, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, no hierarchy. Lead from the circle. Treat people well even when, they're, when you're mad at them. And try to figure out what they're trying to offer. Because most people are trying to offer something in the church. But they don't know how to offer it. Or they don't think that we will like it if they offer it or they're not really very good at it, but they still want to offer it. And you just have to take that graciously and gratefully. And that's native, you know, that's, that's the potluck, that's the, I think it's resilience. It's the resilience of literally having survived pretty close to genocide. When my grandmother enrolled me in the Blackfeet Nation, we were under 2,000 people. And now we're, we're not at 20,000 yet. We're at about 19 and a few thousand. So we were almost gone. And so there, there's that resilience in our people that we just don't give up. We do not give up. A Native person usually does not give up. If they're called to do something for a family member or a friend or something, we don't give up. We just we will not give up. That's that resilience that we have that I think all, I mean, others have it. We're not, we don't have the corner of the market, but there's Jewish people that have it. They didn't give up after the genocide, the Holocaust, no. And so I preached one time and I said, if you don't remember anything after I finish my sermon, except one thing, I want it to be this. We are still here. Mm. Amen. Amen. We are still here. Yes, Buzz. Uh, Bishop Charles has a new book coming out uh, in October, and the name of it is We Survived the End of the Earth. It's all about the failures. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. So in October.
October, Bishop Stephen Charleston, We Survived the End of the Earth, a new yeah. book. Wonderful. Yeah, I, um, thank you for, I did not know that. That's wonderful. Well, one yeah. more round of applause for our guests. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Very welcome. Thus concludes the end of our time together. Thank you all for staying. Um, it has been a full, beautiful, wonderful day, um, and in large part because we got to spend it together. And mm -hmm. so thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you to you. our Ochre Hater Guild, and enjoy the rest of your day. Todd? Mary, will you close us out with a prayer? Of, uh, Mary, will you close us out with a prayer? Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. Let us pray. To the creator of all of us, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the beauty of the earth, for all the living creatures who are our relatives. We give you thanks for even having the opportunity to come together at this time. And we ask that you will continue to guide us in the way of love, and care for those we meet, especially those we meet who are hurting and who are frustrated and without housing and without food. Let us be the one who's there for them. Let us remember the, the lessons of Jesus and, and just do them, have the courage to, to follow those lessons. And let us remember that even when we make mistakes, we are loved by the one who made us. And we can turn around and offer that love to those in our life who make mistakes with us. Give us that grace that we have experienced with Christ, that grace that we have experienced with our friends and parenting and others in our life. And let us remember that we don't have to have all the answers but we do have to have the love for one another. And if we have the love, the answers will come that we seek. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our brother, the one who broke no promises. Amen. Thank you. It's been a great time. It's fun for me. Thank you. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, all right. Yep.